The 3rd of April, 1988, a family out hill walking in the Wicklow Mountains make a gruesome discovery. The remains of 27-year-old mother of two, Antoinette Smith, had lay submerged in the bog for nine months. But what sequence of events culminated in her murder and clandestine burial? To this day, the crime remains unsolved. Mrs. Smith went to a late-night disco in Parnell Street with her friend Maria Cunningham. About 3.30 a.m., a woman closely resembling Mrs. Smith got into a taxi in Westmoreland Street with two men. They were dropped off at Rathfarnham Village, but extensive inquiries have failed to find where they went. It wasn't until nine months later that Mrs. Smith's body was found in a shallow grave seven and a half miles away in the Dublin mountains. The Gardaí are now trying to find the vital clues that will bridge the gap between Rathfarnham and the Dublin mountains where her body was found. Anyone who can help is asked to contact the incident room at any Garda station. The disappearance of Antoinette Smith in July 1987 and the subsequent discovery of her body in April 1988 received considerable media attention and sparked an extensive Garda investigation. Having found no resolution to the case at the time, however, 25 years later, the evidence is now being re-examined by the Garda Serious Crime Review Team. Antoinette Smith's case was one uh, such case that we reviewed, and as a result of that, a decision was made by me that we would carry out a full review of it based on, on what, what we found during the preliminary review. We're currently examining exhibits uh, with, with witness account and we're also speaking to re retired investigators who were also involved with the case at that particular time. As the serious crime review team re-examined the original case notes, so Antoinette's two daughters constantly review what memories they have of their mother. Piecing together the scraps they can recall and any that other family members can provide. She came from a family of four brothers. She lived with her mother and father. They, the family home she lived in, she grew up in Crumlin. She was real tall, glamorous, like always had her makeup done and always in her high heels. Like, that's what I always remember, because she's always here coming, especially if you were up to no wood. You'd hear the heels and no to leg it. I see somebody under the covers. Got you. <laughs> I don't remember much because I was so small, like, but, like, I remember, like, that and my mum did, like, we tried to copy her, because, like, my mum was, like, the cool older person, like, you wanted to copy, like, so. I wouldn't have memories, it's just really photos for myself, and that's what I hold as treasures to me, and it's, it's good to look back on that, to remind me that that's my mum and them photographs, and she does exist, so. She had got married quite young. I think she was approaching her 20th birthday when she had got married. Uh, eight years on almost, uh, life had changed considerably that uh, herself and her, her uh, husband, Carl, had separated at this stage. Antoinette was at home with the girls, living in Clondalkin, and then Carl would have access on a Saturday. A very hardworking woman. She was caring for her children at home. She was a very outgoing person. Uh, and uh, had a, a great personality, bit of a chatterbox as well. It's nice when they tell us stories because there's a lot like we don't know being so young. Like, she's fun of them, like any 27 year old, like mad into music, fashion, going out with her friends, normal 27 year old. She was interested in getting out when she could. Uh, the rare moments that she could get out. And that's what brought her to have this idea on the Friday uh, in July 1987 to go to the David Bowie concert the very next day.
Slane Castle in 1987 was the main place for Irish music lovers to catch the big international acts. For Antoinette, the opportunity to see David Bowie performing live was one that could not be passed up. So having decided to go with a friend, all that was left was to arrange that the children would stay with their father. She was going to stay out with her friend and stay in the friend's house in Clendalkin and then uh, go back to her own home on the Sunday, maybe around noon or so. So that was the plan and Carl readily agreed to that. The day mum was going to the concert, she dropped us off with my dad. My dad was in the fire crew, so we were going down. I loved playing in the fire truck, so off we went. When Mum was leaving us, like, she told us the usual, like, I love you, be good. I'll bring home presents if you would, so, like, little kids still love getting presents, so we said goodbye, and like, she had, like, our jeans and, like, our heels, and obviously they were going out, so she should be done up. That parting image was to be the last time that Antoinette's daughters would see their mother. The next day, they waited patiently with their father for her return. She never arrived home. And her husband, Carl, was very concerned and started making inquiries with Antoinette's mother uh, as to whether she had gone there. She hadn't uh, asked around the rest of the family. Uh, and there was no trace of Antoinette at all. Uh, so went to the Gardaí to say he wanted to report uh, that his uh, wife Antoinette was missing. An investigation took place in order to establish her whereabouts. Uh, her friends uh, that, were, that were known at the particular time were interviewed and uh, places she had uh, frequented were also visited by the Gardaí in an in, in efforts to locate her. The investigation was able to trace Antoinette's movements from when she had left her children off with their father. She would have walked up with her friend onto the German Road where she went into uh, one of the local pubs, Valhattans. She had a drink in there and then she went to another pub uh, next door where she had one more drink. She then went with her friend, they got a bus uh, into the city centre. One of the first things they did when they got into town was they got matching t-shirts and put on the t-shirt the moment that they they bought them. These were uh, t-shirts, they had the David Bowie image on the front and then pink lettering spelling out Bowie on the front. On the back was the lettering uh, for Slane 87. Also the support act was mentioned on the t-shirt Big Country and the word groovy as well. And they then got a bus out to Slane. They met up with a number of people in Slane. We, we have people that have said that they met her. Two people met her at a chip van, and after the concert, the concert end, she then got a bus back into the city centre of Dublin. From then, they continued their, their day's adventure. They ended up going to uh, a disco, the La Mirage disco, up uh, at Parnell Street, close to the Parnell Monument. They met up with a number of people there. She danced on the floor. She, she enjoyed disco dancing and um, a number of people spoke to her there. She had a, a number of drinks in the club. Uh, and after the club had finished, she left with her friend and uh, two other people. I said, where are you going? Where are you going? I'm going home. No! Antoinette wanted to stay out. And um, perhaps you can understand that, that she was out on a day, maybe a, a day she wouldn't normally have and wanted to continue uh, her evening. It's one hour, one hour, one hour. Come on, all right. Come on, you're fine, Carrie. Look, take yeah. my key and let yourself in there, all right? All right, I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Antoinette walked with the two people that, that, she, that she knew, the two male friends, and they walked up towards O'Connell Street. Uh, they decided to get a taxi home and the, the last she, uh, Antoinette was seen on O'Connell Street was walking on the, the left-hand side, the Gresham Hotel side of O'Connell Street and she was walking up towards O'Connell Bridge at that particular time. It was somewhere between 2.15 and 2.45 a.m. on the 12th of July 1987 and that's the last sighting we have of Antoinette actually by our friends. In the following days, weeks, months, uh, the extended members of her family also searched for her. 
carried out whatever inquiry, spoke to all her friends, uh, trying to find out what happened. And for nine months, they simply did not know where she was. This was a period of limbo for Antoinette's family. But while the adults could at least comprehend the situation in some way, for Antoinette's two young girls, suddenly living without their mother proved extremely confusing. I don't remember what we were told at the time. Obviously, we would have been told something to say with us, like, but, like, you know, we did hope she'd come back being, like, so smart, like. My dad was trying to, to keep a family home going, trying to keep it as normal as possible for himself and my sister at the time, which wasn't easy for him because he hadn't, he wouldn't have known what was going on any more than anybody else would have. So to keep a, two young kids, especially girls, <laughs> Um, happy and as normal as possible. I say it was extremely tough on him and I'd say it definitely took its toll on him. The first Christmas that, like, obviously she was still missing at the time, it, it, it was weird not having her there because Christmas is a big thing in our house. Like, and it's quite a special time for most families. Like, um, you were always conscious like, that she wasn't there, you know. It was hard. I'd say it was tougher for Lisa. She probably took upon herself that she felt that she had to take on a role because I was so small and that there wasn't that mother figure that she obviously... It obviously came first nature to her. She wouldn't have to... Not that the family put it on her. That it would have... She would have felt the responsibility. I owe this. I need to do this. And I say it was pretty tough for I felt I had to be the one to mind her because she was so small, like, you know. I felt I had to protect her because that was, in, in a sense, my way of dealing with it. And while this period of limbo was to come to an end nine months later, its conclusion would only bring more questions for both the family and Gardie. In July 1987, a 27-year-old mother of two named Antoinette Smith mysteriously disappeared following a night out in Dublin. It was nine months later, in April 1988, when a body was discovered in the Wicklow Mountains. The Gardaí from the Dundrum then went to the location where they found the remains and immediately an investigation took place. The area was preserved and the, the, the Garda Technical Bureau attended at the scene. When the body was fully exposed, I saw that it was in an advanced state of decomposition and a very significant thing, two plastic bags had been placed on the head of the deceased and tied. Right from the start, the Gardaí knew that they were dealing not only with a murder, but with what appeared to be uh, a very cold, calculating, callous murder. Uh, and what they were trying to do then was establish the identity of the victim. We conducted a detailed examination of the location where the body had been concealed and also the surrounding area. During the course of that search, we found a door key and items of clothing, including a T-shirt. This T-shirt would prove vital during the post-mortem when Professor John Harbison, who, unable to ascertain a definitive cause of death due to the advanced state of decomposition of the body, was able to glean some evidence from it. As part of his inquiries, he was able to wash this T-shirt in a special formula so that the wording became clear as he washed it out. The information found on the T-shirt allowed Gardaí to narrow down the list of possible identities. Cross-checking with the Missing Persons Bureau revealed that a young woman had gone missing the previous year, following the David Bowie concert. She had an address in Clondalkin. We decided then we would test this key in the door of her residence, which didn't work. But on the Missing Persons report was uh, a note from her friend and she had a key to her house. So the next move was to go to her house 
and examine and see that the key fit the entrance door, which it did. Now, this in itself was a great indicator to us that it was the body of Antoinette Smith. For Antoinette's family, this discovery, while offering some immediate closure, would herald the beginning of a large-scale public investigation, which in turn would expose Antoinette's two young children to information that they would struggle to process. There's no easy way for a father to tell his two young kids that isn't, their mummy isn't coming back. So I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Like nowadays, it's just, now that I'm a grown adult, I still wouldn't wish that on anybody. Like, it's just, it wouldn't be right. A couple of months later, it dawned on me, like, she's not actually coming back. I'm not actually going to see her. You know, it was at the funeral, and even at the funeral, I, I didn't understand it, because I was never at a grave, so I didn't understand what that meant. Obviously, I knew she wasn't coming back, because my father told me that she's in heaven, and just to look for the brightest star, that's the way we were told to remember. My mum is that look for the brightest star in the sky and that's that's where her mum is, that's who she is. And still we still look for that star, so will remind us that's who she is. So while Antoinette's family were coming to terms with the fact that their loved one had been murdered, for Gardie, the hunt to find the person or people responsible was on again in earnest. But with nine months having passed since the murder was committed, this time they were playing catch-up. The killer or killers had been so successful in hiding Antoinette's body for nine months, they had a nine-month head start. Perhaps nine months to begin practicing their own alibis, perhaps even beginning to believe their own lies in their own head, uh, and maybe to get family members to start covering for them, uh, or other people, uh, and perhaps to, to just uh, put some distance between them and the crime. The investigators made a number of appeals to the public uh, through the media uh, for assistance. Uh, during one of those appeals, a taxi driver who had been working in the O'Connell Street area came forward and he provided information to the investigators to the effect that he had picked up two males and a female at approximately 3.30 a.m. In, on the O'Connell Street area. The two men had been at his taxi talking to him, seemingly negotiating a fare or asking uh, if they could be taken somewhere when this woman came up to the two men. And the taxi driver later said that it seemed that she knew the men. Uh, there was uh, some type of, of conversation between them and she got into the taxi with the men. The description he gave of the female uh, was it bared a very close resemblance to the appearance uh, and physique of Antoinette Smith. He described both males as being in their early 20s. One of the men he described as being tall, and he said that this man's uh, knees actually protruded into the back of the seat, and he, he could actually feel them when they were driving in the taxi. The other male he described as being smaller, and that he had dark hair parted in the centre, collar-length hair. He described this person as having a rough Dublin accent, and he appeared to be very smart in his chat and uh, slightly threatening towards him. One of the men, he said, had been joking about maybe trying to take the taxi or hijack it in some jokey way, indicating uh, doing something to the taxi driver. And the man's friend, it seems, was trying to shut him up or hush him or something like this. But the taxi driver remembered that because it is unusual. During the journey from the city centre or country area up to the Yellow House area in Red Farnham, that he said that he overheard the people in the back of the car, that's the two males and the female, and they were discussing the fact that they were going to go to a party in the Red Farnham area. This was a very important piece of information because that journey brought those three people, including someone who's most likely Antoinette, out to Rathfarnham. And Rathfarnham, in turn, is towards the foothills of the Dublin Mountains. And Antoinette then is found up the Dublin Mountains, buried in the bog, so that this might be the route that the killers or killer had taken. As part of the review of this particular case, uh, we would view this sighting as being very significant uh, based on the fact that the two males, as described by the taxi driver in his car, 
on that particular night have never been identified and haven't come forward. So it would be uh, of, of, of particular importance to the review and to the investigation that the two people are, are uh, identified and spoken to. If the person who was in the taxi was actually Antoinette Smith and she had attended a party in the Redfarnham area on that particular night, we would be very interested to know where that party was and who was at the party at that particular time. When Antoinette's case was featured along with an appeal for further information in the Garda patrol programme on the 9th of May 1988, a second and possibly vital witness statement was brought to the Gardaí. A man comes forward who may hold very important information. At the very least, it is interesting. At most, it may actually be the key to this murder investigation. This man could remember that back on the 12th of July, 1987, he had gone out early one morning to walk his dog at Crua Wood, uh, up past Rathfarnham at the foothills of the Dublin mountains. This was about two miles away from where Antoinette Smith's body was later found. He had driven to that location to walk his dog and uh, was heading up a hill when a man comes down from the hill and goes past him quite quickly, doesn't want to engage in conversation. The witness said he said, good morning or how are you or something, and there was no response from this, this man walking down the hill who didn't want to engage and seemed to just want to get out of there quite quickly. So the witness looks back down the hill uh, and sees that this man is now talking to another man uh, who has appeared as well. He was concerned for his own safety and for safety of his car, which he had parked close by. He kept both males under observation and he was quite satisfied that they weren't out walking because they certainly weren't equipped for walking due to their dress. He described the first person as being approximately 26 years of age. He said he had a tin face. Uh, he said that his hair was coming down over his forehead uh, towards his face. Uh, he was wearing dark clothes and dark shoes. He also described the other person whom he saw in the distance uh, as wearing uh, light coloured denim jeans and he didn't have a better description. One of the interesting aspects of, of the description is perhaps the first person he describes as being in their, maybe in their mid-twenties. So that person now very much might still be around, would perhaps be in and around 50 years old, maybe either side of 50, uh, may still be in the area, may still be in the Dublin area. They certainly know who they are uh, and maybe other people do as well. feel hurt because that person or them people took so much away from us that I, I hope they can sleep with themselves at night because they've tore a whole family apart and it's just, you can't get that back. Like it wasn't just the fact that our mummy was dead and she was gone and we weren't going to see her again. It was like the fact that she was so cruelly taken from us and the person that done it is still out there. They may have thought they've got away with a murder. It happened about 25, 30 years ago, and but they certainly haven't, because we will come back knocking on their doors, seeking information, and we won't give up until the people responsible for the death of Anthony Ned Smith are brought to justice. Catching the person is not going to bring her back, but it helped me sleep a little bit better. It doesn't go away for us, and it would be nice to get closure as well and to let her rest in peace. <laughs>